let's, let's talk about Tesla. And if one were to believe everything one reads in the press, <laughs> which I don't as a former journalist, <laughs> the recent fires in the Tesla cars sound like the Hindenburg disaster in 1937. Right, the humanity. Um, reality is somewhat different. Tell us, tell us what really happened there. Uh, yeah, um, so I, I, mean, I think first of all that it's fair for uh, a new technology to uh, receive more scrutiny than, than, than older technologies because it should be held to a higher standard. But there's some reasonable limit to, to what that uh, increased standard should be. And I mean, since, since the Model S went into production about a year and a half ago, there have been about a quarter million gasoline car fires in the US. Um, about 400 deaths, 1,200 serious injuries. Um, our three fires, which caused no injury, um, received more headline news than the other quarter million combined. That seems like an unreasonable ratio. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe all three owners of those cars who crashed wanted to get another one. Yes. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like... Don't take my word for it. Like they, they, that, that was like said. Well, how, how soon can they get a, a, a loaner car until the insurance thing gets figured out? And you know, so it was, we gave them one right away. But um, yeah, I mean that's the acid test. Like, do the, does the guy that was that experienced the fire does he want to have that same car again? He feels safe in it. Yeah. Um, stock price down again today, ten percent. Do you care about that? I mean, it's. It kind of sucks running a public company. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the stock goes through these huge gyrations, um, and uh, yeah, but for, for, for like seemingly arbitrary reasons. Uh, and then I'm asked to explain why it changed. I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it should be pointed out it's up 300% on the year. Yeah. I, Right. I mean, on balance, that's still, still good. Um, but <laughs> I mean, when the stock price was way higher and people asked me what I think of the valuation, I said, well, I think it's probably more than we have a right to deserve. We'll try to get there in the long term, and I think we will, and probably exceed it. But uh, it, I, I would not try to justify that a company with a little over $2 billion of revenue should be worth $22 billion in market cap. That does seem pretty high to me. You know, it's, it's like... <laughs> And it's fair to say you wouldn't be there without government subsidy. Well, I think it would have taken longer. So the, 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 I mean, the there's a slight misperception about the history of Tesla, which is that, that the, the government funding was pivotal. It was an accelerant, but it was not pivotal. The, the really pivotal thing, uh, point was an investment from Daimler in 2009, early 2009, when there was, I, I basically spent all the money I had, and we had, one company that was willing to invest, or one entity that was willing to invest, period, and that was Daimler. And, and uh, if they hadn't come in with that investment, we would definitely be dead. Um, fortunately, dead. They, bankrupt, finished. Yeah, gone. Um, and uh, fortunately, they, they, they did. And we've, we've done a number of vehicle programs with Daimler. There's the uh, Mercedes B Class, which is uh, not currently produced in the US, but it's very popular in, in Europe and other parts of the world. We'll be coming to the US and that'll have a Tesla battery pack and powertrain. It'll be the largest electric vehicle program in Daimler history. Uh, so that, uh, you know, so good, yeah, got a great relationship. They've, they've been a great, great supporter. Um, how about self-drive version of Tesla? Um, I do think that's an important technology. Although, uh, the, the difficulty increases exponentially to get to fully self-driving, um, to cover all the corner cases. Um, so I think we can get to maybe 90% of miles driven being autopilot, as we call it, because we're using the sort of aircraft analogy. Um, I think we'll get there pretty soon, maybe in a few years. But uh, then covering that last 10% is really difficult. And, and so getting to 90% to 99, then to 99.9, .9, and then, I mean, ultimately, to be truly self-driving, like you can fall asleep and the car arrives at your destination, uh, which would be really great. <laughs> Some people uh, do already, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Um, they die. Yeah. Um, that, 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 that's, that just, it just, I think you probably need like six nines of reliability. 
Um, like, like the standard would be w actually way higher than, a, than the safety of a, of a person, or probably by a factor of 10 or 100, you know, in order for people to be comfortable. Uh, or otherwise, we'll, well, like this fire thing, you know, just like a car is basically the safest car you could possibly drive if you care about fires. Um, and that, that's not the impression one would have reading the headlines. Uh, you would have sort of the opposite impression. And so for self-driving self or autopilot, um, yeah, hopefully the media doesn't do, do the same thing, it's same, like, mega disproportionate response, but, uh, but I do think that it should be held to a standard that's maybe like 10 times better than a person. And I know Google's working on this too, 10 years, more or less? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the right path is probably a little different from what Google is pursuing. Um, and uh, well, Larry Page is an old friend of mine. I've known him since before he got venture funding for Google. Um, and I think he's a really brilliant guy. But uh, I mean, it's, it's not, Google is, isn't focusing on, on, on autonomous cars, whereas it, it's going to be a pretty significant focus for Tesla. And, and from our standpoint, it, it only matters if the autopilot capability is, does not result in a, in a su substantial cost increase to the car. And the, the, way, the way the Google sensor suite is set up, it's like, it like 60 grand. You know? I mean, that's like a lot. I want to ask you about risk taking. Um, because there's a theory that entrepreneurs who hit it out of the park one time make that billion dollar plus company work. They are reluctant to do it again, not because they're afraid of losing their money, but because they feel if they were to, to fail a second time around, then in their own minds maybe they would think, well, the first time it was just luck. It wasn't really my own skill or my own sense of how to run a business. But not only did you, well, you rose, pay, PayPal came up to 1.5 billion. You, you got out of that. Not only did you invest again, but you invested again twice. Not only that, but you chose probably two of the most risky capital intensive industries to go with. Rocket technology, which is basically a bomb, <laughs> right. directed up, yeah. and then cars, which are, you know, we know what's happening in Detroit. Yeah. Um, so what is it that, that motivates there to do that, to go through the crucible yeah. again, two times again? Yeah, I'm not sure it was the right decision, but. <laughs> um, so far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it's much less fun than it, than it may appear, uh, but, uh, I mean, the case of, uh, what I thought of, I would do was start and run SpaceX, then, and, and then create an electric car company with, with a few other people, uh, work just, but just like apply 20% of my time and, and work on the product design. Because um, I mean, like, my main thing is, in, is engineering and design. So, uh, that, yeah, that was um, an illusion. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and, uh, and then but I, I, I don't really have any choice but to, to, to apply a ton of time to Tesla, or the company would be, you know, definitely dead. So. Um, but the other way to do it, you could have stayed in Silicon Valley, started another few internet companies, made a oh, yeah. billion dollars, and then you could have bought Chrysler and probably bought yeah. NASA too, and you wouldn't have to start from scratch. <laughs> that seems yeah. too easy. Yeah. Um. <laughs> All right, we'll, well move I, on. I don't, I don't really want to, the point is not to sort of own a car company, but rather to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport. And, um, it seemed like it would be difficult. Uh, <laughs> Let's talk about SpaceX. SpaceX, you have said you started with the specific intention of getting to Mars. Uh, yeah. It, well, the origin of SpaceX uh, was, was actually not... Or it, 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 my, interest in space, my initial thought in space was that uh, it, it wasn't possible to create a company, um, and I mistakenly thought that uh, the reason that we had not sent people to Mars was because we had lost the will to explore or something, or like maybe that, and, and I thought, well, maybe that needs to be reignited, 
And so I came up with this idea to do a, basically, a philanthropic mission to Mars with, with a 100% probability of losing all the money um, in, in order to reignite interest in that goal. Um, but after, after a while, I realized that that's, that was actually that was a mistake. I mean, particularly the United States is, is a nation of explorers. You know, came here from other parts of the world. Um, I think more than any other country is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. There's, there's no lack of will. The, but people need to believe that there's a way, uh, that, that in a way that's feasible and, and that it's not going to bankrupt the country and their living standard will be, won't be materially affected. You know, if, and then I think they're super, super keen on, on that, that goal. Now, as you look out, whatever we're talking, 10, 15, 20 years to get to Mars, it's not just rocket technology, and, and you've talked about reusable rocket technology, it's also yeah. how you shield people from radiation. It's a 10, 12-month trip. What you do when they arrive, you know, how are they going to live there? Are you, is that something that you want to work on too, or will you partner with other companies? How do you, how do you see that playing out over the next decade? Well, I actually think the, the, the technology required to live on Mars is not, not particularly difficult. Um, but, but, but getting there is, is really difficult. Uh, uh, I mean, it's like hundreds of millions of miles. Um, to get to Death Valley. Yeah, exactly. To get to a place that kind of looks like Arizona, you know. Uh, <laughs> or like a cold version of Arizona with not quite as much water. Um, so, um, I mean, at least that, that's, that's my best, my, my guess is, I, I think if we, can, if we can get there, the technology required to live there will, is, is not, a, not, a, not a really big challenge. I mean, uh, Mars has some advantages. It's got a, it's, it's quite sort of Earth-like in, in some ways. It's got a rotational period of 24 and a half hours, uh, by far the closest of any other planet. Uh, the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Uh, no, it's, it's, not, it's at a low pressure, but if you were to have a transparent dome, uh, you, you, all you'd need is a, is a pump uh, and, some, and some fertilizer, and you could grow plants on Mars. And the plants would convert the CO2 to oxygen. Um, the other thing that's been big in the news recently is the Hyperloop, um, which you have sketched out, you estimate, from LA to San Francisco in 35 minutes. Yeah, now, you could push that a little bit, but... Well, I'd be yeah. happy if I could get from Santa Monica to downtown yeah, LA. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know you have your personal issues with the 405. The 405 is, like, this is, like, the most brutal construction project I've ever personally witnessed. <laughs> I mean, it's, like, mind-boggling. Um, but I, I also know that... So you sketched this out, but I know that you're... Your, your plans for the Hyperloop have been put into some pretty sophisticated simulation technology. Yeah. And it looks like it actually might work. Am I right? Yeah. Um, and, and we did run simulations at SpaceX and Tesla. Uh, so, I mean, you, know, we, you know, we thought it would work, but I mean, I, I don't, actually don't think it's particularly, like, I mean, I, th I, th I, think, I think it's like the, the engineer of it, that, that it would work is, is actually pretty, pretty obvious, honestly. But, I mean, it's, uh, so th I think the larger issues are political, you know, getting the, the, the political support to do something like that, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, making sure the economics pan out. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope someone d does it, because I think it would be cool. I mean, it would be great to, to have something like that. You know, it's just like, it doesn't seem like our mass transportation is getting better. It seems to be... Uh, getting worse, so that's that's not a good future. You said something there. You hope somebody else would do it. I'm curious, what makes you really so unique is not only your ability to dream big, but to execute. There are lots of utopian thinkers out there, but they cannot execute. Yeah. Um, but there are some other people who can do good things. And I'm wondering what seems to motivate you. You see things that frustrate you, or you think are are not as good as you like, and then you try and fix them. You've worked on on solar power. You've worked on electric cars and, and on interplanetary space travel. And I'm wondering what other things about America and about the world, for that matter, would you like to see fixed, either by a company you might do yourself or <laughs> by someone a smart entrepreneur? What, 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 what else out there is feasible? You know, we all want to get yeah. rid of world poverty and, mm -hmm. and get rid of childhood diseases, but 
But what, what problems out there can feasibly be fixed, say, in our lifetimes? Well, I mean, I think, first of all, um, the world's actually pretty great right now. Uh, I mean, arguably better than any point in history. Um, and this, this is sometimes uh, lost. If you read the newspapers, they're, they're like a, 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 a magnification of all the world's problems. It's like, the, I mean, newspapers seem to be attempting to answer the question, what was the worst thing that happened on Earth today? <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's... Yeah, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah, and, and, and it's like, okay. I mean, and I think there's... There is kind of an evolutionary reason for that because it makes more sense. To, like you want to prioritize danger over reward, or, 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 or because it, it, you know, if you get eaten by the lion, it's game over. But you know, if, if you if you forget where you left some snack, that's that's okay. I mean, you you know. So so there's a it, it, it's not quite the same in terms of the risk risk reward balance, but. We didn't evolve with newspapers uh, and, and, and global media, so like our brains sort of having a fear response to a, lot, a bunch of dangers that are extremely unlikely to ever affect us. Uh, but yeah, it's just yeah. clear. You have, uh, I believe, about 3,000 people at Tesla. We have 6,000, 6, 6, yeah. 6,000, I'm, I'm now informed, and SpaceX is? Uh, is 3,500. So that's a massive agglomeration of engineering talent. Huge. Yeah. yeah. If, 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 if I could take the metaphor of, of a ship, how much time do you have to go down into the engine room, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, and fix stuff as an engineer? And how much time do you spend on the bridge steering and looking at the, at the distant horizon? Well, n not a lot on that last point. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's... Uh, I mean, there's, there's a constant flurry of executional challenges, um, and so I try to triage my time according to what would be best for the companies, uh, and and still, you know, have some time to see my kids, you know, because I don't want to miss them growing up. So, it, it, you know, it, it can vary from big issues to things that seem small but actually could have a really big impact. Um, so. I mean, it's, it's all the way from design aesthetics to uh, the details of, of, say, the vehicle functionality, or in the case of the rocket, uh, the, you know, the avionics propulsion system and uh, airframe. Uh, I mean, the rocket is kind of a, has, a, has more, more of a concentrated pucker factor, because um, you've got, you got these launches, and, and um, at least with a car, you can do a recall or like do a software update. <laughs> that's not going to happen with the rocket. So it's like passing grade is 100%, uh, which is induces anxiety. You know. <laughs> How do you handle launch anxiety when you're actually waiting the countdown? We, we saw one here. Well, well the, the, these ones actually. I mean, they're. There's this, I have quite a lot of anxiety. Uh, I always think, oh, there must be some, something that we did wrong, and you know, is there anything I could have done to prevent this hypothetical thing from, from bad thing from occurring? Um, I mean, the, the, the last um, uh, roughly ten launches have have, have worked. Uh, but the, but the, the three launches we started off with did not. So, the, the, by far the worst uh, emotional stress was the, the fourth launch of Falcon 1, because the first three launches did not make it to orbit. They got, they got to sort of space on launches 2 and 3, but they didn't get to full orbital velocity. And, uh, and I, 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 when I started out, I figured I would have enough money for three, three launches. Oops. Yeah. Oops. So it was, it was, we squeaked by on the fourth, fourth one. Um, we sent out a link today. I don't know if, how many of you saw it, but it's of you using a, your hands uh, as 3D molding yeah. uh, 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 sort of tools for stuff you're doing on a computer screen. And it's a, uh, a rocket engine that you're able to manipulate with your hands. Um, and I know that you have told John Favreau, who produced or directed Iron Man, that that was the inspiration, because we see Tony Stark doing this oh, yeah. in the movie. 
Absolutely. Um, and I know also, you know, I've read a bit Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. You've also said yeah. it's been inspiration. So yeah, I'm wondering, I'm a fan of Asimov, actually. When, when you're on the cutting edge of technology today in the fields that you're in, do you feel you've almost got one foot in science fiction? Is that, uh, is, do, you, do you have to be that far ahead? Well, well you have to um, imagine an outcome in order to head in that direction. Um, and science fiction explores a lot of different ideas, so um, it can be you know, helpful as a source of inspiration. Um, and, and, you know, like books, TV shows, movies, I mean, they're all, uh, I think, sources of inspiration. Um, I mean, most of the movies and TV shows about space are totally wrong, uh, but, uh, but they still have interesting ideas. Like the Star Trek communicator um, was uh, an inspiration for the cell phone. Yeah. With the flip, right? Right, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm gonna... In fact, the weird thing is, like, like, the, like the, the phones we have in our pocket vastly exceed what was on Star Trek. <laughs> We're going to go to ask some of our students um, some questions. But first, one more. Um, I saw, I'm a big James Bond fan. You just bought the Lotus Esprit that they used in um, The Spy Who Loved Me, which goes underwater. Yeah. And you're going to make that work. It, so, it's, it's definitely a backbone project. Okay, but, but my uh, question is, <laughs> when do we get to see a functioning version of the Millennium Falcon? That's a tricky one, because it's, it's not actually the right shape. Um, Uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, Note to George Lucas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Falcon 9, our, our Falcon rocket was uh, named after the Millennium Falcon, even though it looks nothing like it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you, that's not the shape you'd want for a spaceship, really. <laughs> okay, so if we can swing the camera to our student so, tables, can we get a so, couple of questions from there, and then I'll go to the written questions from the rest of the audience. So here we go. Good evening, sir. My name's Ariel Hymas. I'm from Vaughan Next Century. Referring to Merlin 9, does SpaceX have a working prototype, and when will it be ready to launch? Uh, well, the, Merlin is the, the name of our, our engine, um, so, and, and Falcon 9 is the name of the rocket. Um, and we, uh, we, we've done um, several launches of, of Falcon 9, um, and, and an important milestone happened a few months ago, which was the, the launch of the next generation Falcon 9, which is designed to be able to return uh, uh, and land at the launch pad. Um, and um, came, we came close on the initial mission, but not, didn't quite get there. Uh, we need to make a few, a few corrections, but I think we, we've got a good chance of getting there next year. Okay, let's go for another one there. Hi. I'm Kennedy Green from Harvard Westlake. So I've seen you speak at a TED Talk, and I remember you spoke pretty emphatically about the success of your innovations and how you kind of take a physics approach, where you take the idea and boil it down to its basics, and from there start to build up. So can you talk about an example where you use that process? Um, well. I think you know an important thing in, in uh, innovation or trying to cre create new things is 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 to try really hard to, to do that, um, which may sound incredibly obvious, but uh, th that's what I find is is most often what people don't do. They actually didn't didn't try super hard to come up with something new, um, and and it is helpful to have cross pollination of industries. Um, I mean, it's, it's been quite difficult to run SpaceX and Tesla, but there has been good, good ideas. You know, if I, since I got both in my mind space, this this good, good ideas going back and forth. The, um, for example, on the car, with respect to the car, the Model S is the only all aluminum body and chassis car made in North America. And very few cars are are all aluminum. In the aerospace industry, it's that that's the default. Um, so it seemed like like obviously the right move in order to minimize the, the non-battery pack mass of the car. So in order to offset you know, fairly heavy battery pack, we had to make the rest of the car light, 
but, but still achieve uh, a five-star safety rating. Um, I don't think it would have been possible to do that if we had used steel, which is the traditional method. Um, and, and what's helped SpaceX has been that the, the car industry is really good at making complicated objects at a low cost. I mean, it's actually quite incredible that like, one can buy a, a decent car for $20,000. I mean, all the stuff that's in that car is, I mean, it's, it's nutty how much stuff is in a car. Um, so uh, at, at SpaceX, uh, I hired a bunch of people from the auto industry to uh, run manufacturing, which has worked out reasonably well. Let's take two more student questions, please, and then we'll come to the other written ones. Hello. Um, I'm Natalie Watson from Marlboro School, and we have a sort of two-part question that builds. So um, <laughs> why do you think Tesla succeeded, whereas other companies, um, car companies, have failed in their methods um, of electric cars? And is the location in Silicon Valley an important part of this? Yeah, I think, I think being in Silicon Valley is pretty important uh, because what's really critical with electric cars is uh, electrical engineering, software, and electronics. Uh, and Silicon Valley has the best concentration of talent in those areas in the world. Um, and, yeah. So, sorry, what was the first part of the question? Why did you succeed? Oh, why do we succeed? Oh, yeah, all right. I'm sorry, what was your question? Um, oh, the first right. part, okay. Um, why do you think Tesla succeeded whereas other car companies failed in their methods of, electric, of electric cars? Like, why do you think Tesla is the leader in this idea? Well, um, I mean, there haven't been that many car company startups. Uh, I mean, there, were, there was sort of Fisker uh, and Coda, um, and, and then a, a few smaller ones, um, and, and then the rest has sort of been some, some fairly small-scale efforts by the big companies. Um, I, I, I think if, if we say what was the difference between, say, Fisker and Tesla, <laughs> that's maybe the bit most direct comparison. Uh, Tesla is a hardcore engineering company, and Fisker is kind of a was based on kind of on styling. You know, it's like styling is good, important, but it's that's not the reason we don't have electric cars. So, it's not you know, but for styling, we we would have electric cars. That's not the reason. Um, so, in the case of Fisker, they made a car that uh, a lot of people think looked really good, but didn't work properly. So, it, then people don't want to buy the car. Um, that's like a pretty reasonable thing, I think. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, if you think of like, like what, what, what's the point of a company existing? The, the point is that it, it, it's, it's a group of people that have gathered together to create a product. If the product is good, the company should exist, and if it is not good, the company should not exist. Um, that seems like fundamental to the nature of companies. So the, I mean, clearly then one should focus on making the absolute best product you can, otherwise you reduce the probability of success. But a lot of companies focus on things that aren't really to do with the product, um, as though a company has any basis for existing apart from doing useful things. That's kind of strange. So one more question. Student question, please. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Eric Palayo from uh, Vaughn Next Century. And uh, regarding the Mars, uh, the proposed Mars expedition, um, what, how exactly do you plan on making it cost efficient? Sure. Um, well, now that is, that is indeed a tricky problem. Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel reasonably possible that um, th that success is at least one of the possible outcomes. Um, <laughs> it, uh, 
this is a, I mean, this is pretty important when you're trying to do something. It's like, well, it can, can that be one of the out outcomes? I wasn't actually uh, confident about that until a few years ago. Um, now, I'm not saying we will get there, but I, 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 I'm confident that it is at least possible. Um, and the, the key to that is having a fully reusable Mars transportation system so that all you're, all you're replacing between flights, maybe for, apart from minor maintenance, is the propellant. Um, I mean, this is, uh, this, like, the reusability is so fundamental to, uh, to having a, 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 st a, a major change in space flight. It's, it would be difficult to overstate its importance. Um, but I mean, I think with analogy to other modes of transport, you can imagine that if airplanes could only be used once, um, they would very few people would fly because um, it would be super crazy expensive. Um, you know, I guess like a 747 costs a quarter billion dollars. You'd need two of them just for a round trip. Uh, but people are not paying half a billion dollars to fly back and forth to London, um, and that's because you can use a 747 like 20,000 times. Um, and for a rocket, you know, a Falcon 9 rocket uh, costs about $60 million to build. And so if it can be used once, obviously that's a $60 million capital cost. But if it can be used 1,000 times, then it's only a $60,000 capital cost. Um, I mean, that is, you know, it's a, it, is, it is the fundamental difference. So you have to have fully reusable, then you, you have to make sure that the propellant used is uh, as low cost as possible. So. Our next generation rockets will be using methane as a fuel, which methane is the, is the lowest cost source fuel on the planet um, by, by a good margin. So, uh, and, and so I, I think if, you, if, if your propellant costs are low and the system is fully reusable, then I think it, it, I think it should be possible to, it should, to move to Mars for less than half a million dollars which I think is, is an important threshold, because if people can sell all this stuff on Earth and move to Mars, well, uh, and there's enough people who, who can do that, um, combined with those who actually want to do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then then, then you, that, that's, that's the, the fundamental thing needed to uh, have a, a growing colony on Mars. I mean, kind of like the way that the U.S. was, it's like the early uh, English colonies in America, um, you know, it, 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 when it became affordable for people to sell all this stuff in England and um, move to America, it grew really fast. Um, in the absence of that, it's, it, it would just require humongous amounts of government support, and, and I think probably wouldn't be, wouldn't result in a self-sustaining civilization. So the economics of it are extremely fundamental. No, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to go to some questions that we got from the floor. Um, and the first one I want to ask is, um, what is, what do you think is the next battery technology after lithium ion? I guess lithium ion has sort of reached its ceiling more or less, or no? No, I, I, no, I, think, there's, I think there are substantial improvements uh, that will occur with lithium ion batteries um, without any, you know, no, no, no miracles required. Um, the, the, the thing uh, with lithium ion, Technology in terms of the cost and energy density uh, is that the, the sort of average improvement per year is about eight percent, which isn't that noticeable on a one-year basis. But but you know, compound interest is a very powerful force, uh, and, and so after say four or five years, you, the, the cost is cut in half, assuming there's a forcing function for a strong forcing function for improvement, which I think electric cars provide. So uh, you know I feel pretty good about achieving um, a substantial reduction in the cost of the battery pack, uh, say, in, in kind of the, the three or four year time horizon. Still way behind Moore's law for microchips. Oh, yeah, sure. Double no, like nothing, nothing, I mean, Moore's, the only thing that uh, operates at Moore's law speed is Moore's law. Um, <laughs> you know, just, semiconductors just had this incredible advantage that as you made them tinier, they got way more efficient. Um, for something with like that's that's a, lo a large like a macro structure like a battery pack. You just don't have, or well, really almost anything. <laughs> Essentially, I say in fact anything <laughs> except microprocessors and memory. 
um, that, that does, does not improve at that pace. Um, yeah. um, another question here, um, it's about medical technology. Is there a medical application or technology that you, you would like to change or see somebody else change, work on? Well, medical technology, um, well, I think the thing that would sort of most profoundly affect people uh, would be uh, to, to be able to recode genetics, which is obviously a dodgy situation. Um, uh, but that, that's the thing. It, like, we're, we're, we're close to saturation on, on lifespan. I mean, it's sort of pretty much leveled out. Um, and, uh, and so even if you solve, say, any one particular disease, you maybe slightly improve uh, life expectancy, but, but not a lot. Um, you know, it's just like, you're, you kind of have a, a genetic programming for any given species for a certain lifespan. Like, the, like, you cannot make a fruit fly live for 10 years, no matter what you do. I mean, no amount of healthy living vitamins or anything. Um, <laughs> it's, it's like, you know. You can, so, Ray Kurzweil's fruit flies live for 20 years. <laughs> that would be that would be a, tr a truly astounding achievement, um, but yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's a really tricky subject. Uh, you know, it's fraught with with all sorts of moral issues. But um, that's the thing that would most affect people's lives. It, but it's I mean, it certainly is a double-edged sword. So, mm -hmm. here's another question um, from a Tesla owner. Why is there no coat hook in the back? Yeah. He says, he or she says, you can design a rocket, but you forgot the coat hooks? Well, I didn't actually forget it. I just, I intentionally didn't like it, so I didn't put it there. Um, like, the aesthetics of it really bothered me, but, um, and, uh, you know, obviously some people disagree with that decision. Um, but I think, I think we might have, um, a, a retroactive fix for that if somebody has the panoramic roof, uh, which is to, to basically ha have a hook on the, the, the bow section in, in the middle of the roof. Um, and then, the, then the, your, your coat could hang down in the second row passenger footwell, which is actually slightly better than having a coat hook uh, that's stuck on the side of the car. Um, so I, I think we'll probably do that. Um, yeah. Wherever that ca question came from, hold on. It's not the first time I've heard that question. I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> Is there a future in hydrogen-fueled engines? Uh, yeah, actually, I'll mention one little anecdote, which is oh, yeah? uh, in, in, the, in the beginning of the Model S production, I also didn't have um, reading lights in the second row. Because, uh, like, well, people, I thought people were really going towards uh, you know, e-books. Um, Kindle and iPad and that kind of thing. It's like so they have like, their own light. They don't need like a, an actual light in the back. Um, uh, and uh, and I was driving with one of my kids, and he, and he was trying to read his book. Daddy. Yeah, I mean, he he said uh, this is the stupidest car in the world. Uh, <laughs> 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 like, all right, we'll put the light back in. Um, hydrogen fuel engines, they have a future? I, I, you know, I, I don't think so. Uh, hydrogen is a very difficult uh, energy storage mechanism. I mean, essentially, it's a, it's a means of storing energy chemically. Uh, but there are way better, if you want to do that, there are way better materials than, than hydrogen. I could go with methane or propane way before hydrogen. Um, in fact, the way that they make the hydrogen is by taking methane and, and chopping the, the carbon atom off. So, like, well, that seems like a waste. Um, uh, you know, or, or they'll do electrolysis, which is even worse. Uh, so, so it's a really energy intensive. It, it's either like either taking, either still mining hydrocarbons on a large scale, or um, you're, you're applying massive amounts of electricity to separate uh, H2O. Um, and then sometimes they'll say, oh, well, hydrogen is the most common uh, element in the universe. Yes, but not on Earth, which is an important consideration. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's yeah. It, it, it's one of those things that sort of, 
always sounds like it, it's like it, it, it's one of those things. Like it's the future, and it always will be. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the Hindenburg issue. Yeah, I mean, in, in the case of the Hindenburg, my understanding is that, that the main issue was the, the paint on the outer surface uh, as opposed to the hydrogen itself. But, but hydrogen does combust extremely well. Um, it, 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 hydrogen has a, uh, has a, 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 there's a good argument, argument for hydrogen as a fuel in the upper stage of a rocket. Um, say Saturn V in the second and third stages had hydrogen. Um, and particularly for the upper stage of a rocket where you're not volumetrically constrained. Um, uh, or, or rather, you're, you're mass constrained rather than volumetrically constrained. Uh, hi hydrogen is good if you care about mass and terrible if you care about volume. Uh, and, and it's also horrible from uh, a handling standpoint. This is a really tiny molecule and it goes all over the place. Um, you look at Apple after Steve Jobs and Microsoft after Bill Gates struggle to keep up the momentum. I wonder if you thought about the future of your companies, Tesla and SpaceX. Um, I know you've You've talked about giving away a lot of your money. Um, but then I know you've had some other thoughts about that, and you looked at Ford and wondered if you want to give I mean, what's, where, where are you at on that succession issue now? Well, I, I, I don't know if, like, I'm, I'm not sure about the whole sort of family dynasty from a wealth standpoint thing. I mean, that seems to work, you know, often work out worse than if, 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 if the kid wasn't given a huge sum of money. Um, I mean, unless, unless they've actually demonstrated a, a, a high ability to be a good steward of capital, then um, it, you know, it's not, not going to work out, I think, to give them a huge sum of money. Um, now, now, that said, I, I mean, that, I'm wavering a little bit on that because if you look at the example of Ford and GM, like GM went bankrupt, Ford did not. Ford had the Ford family as a stabilizing influence. So th th there could be some merit to, to having a family stabilizing influence, but, but maybe not necessarily complete control. Um, we're going to end with two questions on the Hyperloop, which has clearly uh, aroused a lot of emotion in Los Angeles. And one is from UCLA Anderson. I know that uh, Gene Block is here, who runs UCLA. Um, but they want to know, how do you envision the Hyperloop as an open source project to be run in traditional enterprise fashion which would make profits? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I guess it, the, I, I, mean, I think it's going to be quite difficult for, for someone to execute uh, the Hyperloop and the thing that will really matter is how good is that company at executing as opposed to the, the basic sort of ideas of, of the system. Um, so I, wouldn't, I don't think a company has to worry too much about um, creating value if they're really good at execution. Um, and uh, I mean, I think what, like, probably the best example of open source is Linux. Um, and there's lots of companies that um, are quite valuable even though Linux is open source. And the follow-up to that is from somebody else who wants to know when will the Hyperloop, Hyperloop potentially be ready, and can we get to Australia? Huh. That would be, I would not recommend it uh, for, for going to Australia, because Australia is really far. Um, so but, like, where, the, where something like the Hyperloop would work best is for distances that are maybe five, about 500 miles, but probably not more than 1,000. Uh, and that's because if, uh, if you compare it to, say, an alternative being supersonic air transport, um, in, in order to go really fast with a plane, you have to climb pretty, pretty high because the atmosphere just looks like molasses when you're going fast. Uh, so you, you, you know, for distances certainly under 500 miles, you spend all your time just ascending and descending, and you don't really get an opportunity to spend time at cruise. Uh, so something like the Hyperloop can comp complete really well in that arena because uh, you, you instantly, or very almost instantly, enter a low-pressure environment. And the, the, so the tube contains a low-pressure low environment that's, you know, like the cruising altitude of, well, it's, it's, it's like very high altitude atmosphere, basically. Uh, and, and so you don't have to spend any time ascending uh, or descending. Um, 
so, so there's no way for, it would be well, extremely difficult for, for, for a plane to uh, be faster than a Hyperloop for distances under 500 miles mm -hmm. um, because of that S and descent thing. Um, however, once you get to long distances, then the cost of the tube starts to become a, a big factor. And, and, uh, and so then I'd say it's probably the right move is to go to supersonic transport because then you're spending a, 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 a large percentage of your time at cruise. And, and you, you, you could probably get there faster with a supersonic aircraft. Interesting. So no kangaroos in the Hyperloop. <laughs> um, I know you have an insane schedule. I know that you have to go from here back to your office tonight. Yeah, I, I apologize for not being at my best. This has it's been just like working most of last night. So. Um, we are deeply grateful you came. You gave us some time.